This show talks about books that feature mental health and mental illness topics. The discussion will be from the point of view of mental health professionals. There are many books that include this topic, and my hope is that more and more people know about them because they help to decrease the stigma and help people not feel so alone in their struggle. I am your host, Robin Tamanaha, licensed marriage and family therapist. Joining me on this episode is my guest, Dr. Stephen Poulter. He wrote the book, The Shame Factor. Hi, Dr. Poulter. Hi, Robin. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for being my guest today. So before we delve into, you know, different topics, I like my guests to first introduce themselves. So is there anything you'd like to say about yourself, like who you are, what you do, or anything else you'd like the listeners to know about you? Sure, Robin. My name is Steve Poulter. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Los Angeles, California. Been in practice for over 30 years and written seven books. But the most recent book is The Shame Factor. And the the exact title is The Shame Factor, um, Heal Your Deepest Fears and Set Yourself Free. And this is a result of working with so many people over the years who kind of want to get to the core of their core or why they don't feel good about themselves. And that's really what I want to talk about today with you, just how to help people kind of get past what they think might isn't really depression or anxiety, but mm-hmm. really that nagging inner feeling or issue they want to get to or about themselves. So that's kind of what I've been doing over the years, and that's why I wrote this book. Nice, nice. Yeah, so let's get into it. I have um I kind of have a few like initial questions. Great. First, you know. Maybe it would be helpful for the listeners to know, like, first, what is shame? Mm -hmm. Two, does it possibly maybe get confused with other things? Like you had just mentioned, even the depression. Yes. So what I'm going to do, Robin, is read in the the book. In the first chapter, I put an actual definition. I call it the working definition of shame, which is a primary emotional wound, not a secondary belief based on a particular action but a paralyzing emotional, mental, psychological state of mind that tends to distort the view of ourselves, ourselves in the world, and others. And it prevents us from developing a loving sense of self and impairing us from really developing trusting, secure, safe relationships that are based on mutual respect and understanding. And it tends to be, uh, uh, second part of the definition, it's a chronic uh, fear state of being discovered as a phony fraud, imposter, there's a chronic fear to shame that there's something people are going to discover about us, discover about us that we're defective. Mm-hmm. I know that's a lot, that's really what shame's about. Yeah. And so tell me more, like, you know, as far as like the fear, how mm-hmm. does that, I guess, how does that kind of show itself or how would that, I guess, like manifest? Well, you know, in, in the book, I talk about that. You know, shame's you know three best friends. You know, are fear, rage, and avoidance. Mm. And people say, okay, not, well, I'm not always angry. No, exactly, you're not always angry. But I talk about seven kind of common emotional cycles that will trigger our shame. Mm. And those cycle emotional triggers be well, the seven are you know the fear of embarrassment, which is that sense of emotional paralysis. And then the second one is feeling angry or invisible or worthless, you know, about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Another emotional trigger for fear is the imposter syndrome, fear that we're a fraud, whether at work, with our friends, our partners, our kids, our family. Another one, particularly right now, is the sense of feeling isolated. And uh, that triggers the fear of uh, rejection, always fearful of being rejected. And the fifth one, emotional state, is we're suspicious of others. We don't trust authority. We don't trust people generally. And when that gets um, triggered in us, ultimately we feel bad. We feel like we're the problem. And the sixth one's the fear of intimacy. Uh, And what underlies that is a sense of feeling like damaged goods, we're unlovable, and trying to date or have a relationship, romantic. That deep down, we're very concerned that we're going to be seen as we're not good enough. Mm. And the last one is the fear of criticism. And that is the inability to tolerate feedback. And it causes us many times to act, uh, to placate, 
be a people pleaser and what we call codependence. We're always seeking the other person's approval so we don't they won't criticize us so we don't feel <gasps> terrible. Mm-hmm. So those are seven common emotional triggers, Robin, in a nutshell. Wow. They start the whole cycle. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it's so interesting given, you know, kind of what's going on right now too, especially yes. said, like, you know, feeling isolated and like we're at home. So like, what do you feel like is important? You know, cause there are, there's so many like great, like all of those are really, really, really good components, you know, but like given where we are now and kind of like what people are going through, like, what do you think is helpful for people to know as far as that? I, I think, well, that's a really good question. I think one of the points, Rob, is, it's all universal. We're all in this together. We all vacillate between all seven. Mm. And let's say right now you're having financial trouble or really worried about money and you're uh, upset about that. And that could get back to fear of embarrassment. That, God, if I had more money or made, did a better, had a better career, I wouldn't be in this situation. And we're afraid to let people know that we might be struggling right now or that we feel isolated, you know, and that, it's hard to let people know that we're, we would like to connect or talk. These are really big deals. Probably uh-huh. uh, the embarrassment factor that you're struggling, which seems counterintuitive. Like, of course we're struggling, but just the idea of being that vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's really, Robin, the biggest issue right now is the sense of feeling vulnerable on a personal relationship on all different levels of our life. And that is like perfect soil or shame to run rampant yeah. in our life. So I hear like, you know, two things. One is like maybe the, like our internal dialogue, like our thoughts, you know, are yes. very, very powerful. And that may be like one kind of way to drive or like sustain that component of yeah. doubt, you know? And two, you know, I wonder how would that kind of be worked through, like to, go from like the embarrassment to, you know, through the, like the vulnerability, like how does that, like if someone say wanted to explore or get in like touch with that, like what, how does that work or what do they do? You know, in the book I talk about, it's kind of the great point. Uh, it's rewriting and rewiring our emotional triggers. Mm. And the four points to that is one, establishing emotional boundaries. You know, and I always talk about all relationships are like playing tennis. You are you have to own 100% of your 50, and they all own 100% of their 50, having emotional boundaries with people. Mm-hmm. Another piece of it is uh, the sense of uh, feeling enmeshed, that we're not responsible for other people's feelings or we're not responsible for their lives. And a third piece of this, I call it emotional sobriety, that we're able to see, see ourselves separate and apart from our partner, our coworkers, the people um, in our lives. And lastly is the ability to tolerate frustration. You know, that right now you can be frustrated. It doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. It doesn't mean your life is bad or things are always going to stay this way. But those are the uh, four keys, kind of having boundaries, realizing when you stop and start with people, Thirdly, emotional sobriety is really being grounded, Robin, is mm-hmm. that we're not reactive, but we're, um, we're, we're deciding how to respond. And the fourth one is how to tolerate frustration. Unlike with embarrassment, for instance, is acceptance, self-acceptance, exposure, and honesty about who we are and maybe not trying to be somebody else. You know, not trying to please others or get other people's approval. There's no saying when you accept yourself, no one else can reject you. You know, when yeah. you, as an example, I hope I'm not talking too much here. I just really yeah. want to just, to just, that's a big one. Really, you being us, the fear of embarrassment right now is being honest about our inner dialogue, you know, and acknowledging how we shame ourselves, how we talk to ourselves. But embarrassment's a big one. I ask people all the time, tell me if you remember your first embarrassing moment or an embarrassing moment you had when you were a child. And it's amazing. You give a little bit of time, it can go back to elementary school, it can go back to, you know, first grade, kindergarten. It, but there's a place there where we felt we're vulnerable and we felt humiliated. And many times that comes into our adult life, Robin, then mm-hmm. when we feel vulnerable today, 
that whole thing comes up again. It has nothing to do with the first grade. It has to do with the present day. But the feelings are not any different. Yeah, I could definitely picture, especially, you know, right now, given the circumstances, how it's almost like these, like what you had explained, people are definitely confronted with it, you know, because, you know, we're at home and things are so, so much at the forefront, whether it's like the news or just like, you know, maybe it's the financial situation and Mm -hmm. feeling embarrassed about that or, you know, some people are going through job loss, like all these different things. So it's very interesting what you said, because yeah, like very much the past or like a, a particular situation or scenario that someone had experienced in childhood in some way or another does make Mm -hmm. its way into adulthood. And it's so interesting now because now it's almost like there's no way around it, you know? So it's also, it's a nice opportunity actually for people to do what you said, which is the inner work because it's, it's like right now it's going to come up anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Rob. And one of the keys to shame, which separates it from depression, anxiety, is that when you feel vulnerable, you feel bad. Guilt is when we feel vulnerable, we did something wrong. Guilt is we did something wrong. Shame is that we're, we are wrong. And I'm quoting Einstein when he said that. For him, they asked him what the difference between guilt and shame are. Guilt, I did something wrong. And shame is, I'm bad. Mm. So that's where embarrassment comes in. We don't, we don't want to feel those feelings of being vulnerable. And right now, we all feel it financially, emotionally, relationally, our, our careers. But even our health, I mean, I don't want to minimize that either. Yeah. And, and two, it's, it's okay to, to be vulnerable. See, and that, see, that's a paradox. The, you know, there's no saying, you know, we're as strong as our weaknesses are. Mm. You know, and self-acceptance really wipes out this whole fear of embarrassment. Like, you're feeling comfortable with yourself. You know, it doesn't matter what someone else says. You feel good about you, which is really positive. Yeah. I hope Very that. Positive. Yeah. You know, and and so it sounds like um, it sounds like in a way too, like like your book is like almost like a guidebook in a way. Like there's yes. definitely pieces that they, there's like really good takeaways, and I would imagine too, like possible like thought provoking questions to really do this inner work and really think about yeah. everything. You know, it, people say, "Did you write a self help?" No, this is more of a textbook for all of us to use on how to kind of cut through the brush cut through the force of shame mm. and really expose it internally for what it is because shame can't handle exposure. Shame is much better with avoidance, denial, and amnesia. <laughs> so it's one of my favorite words, uh, emotional amnesia. Like we forget that first grade incident on the surface, but emotionally it's alive and well as if it happened yesterday. And that's a huge thing is in order to, also work through things or to get in touch with, you know, different, you know, maybe difficult thoughts and feelings is confronting it. And part of it is like the acceptance piece. Like it's, it'd be kind of difficult without that. Yeah. It, and part of it is a rebuttal. Like, Mm -hmm. okay. So what if people know you're struggling financially right now? Okay. At the end of the day, the hardest judgment we have is about ourselves, not Mm -hmm. someone outside of us. Now we may, pin that on somebody, whether it be a parent or a partner or a friend, but ultimately it comes from us. And to the degree, Rama, that we work on self-acceptance, like this is who I am, this is who I am today. You know, that breeds taking um, personal responsibility. It really sets you free from the shame factor. Shame has no control of you emotionally. Very powerful. Very powerful. Another one, Rama, and is since right now of isolation feeling isolated, and many times we feel isolated because we feel defective or inadequate or we don't want to be vulnerable, and we isolate to kind of offset that fear of experiencing rejection. But isolation just, it's what we say to ourselves about not being with somebody. You know, like being with yourself starts your ability to heal yourself. Many times isolation is viewed as a negative. Yeah, and I picture, too, like maybe even some almost avoidant behaviors, too, you yes. know, in, in a way as another way to kind of not. Um, cause it, and I imagine, too, it's it's not the most comfortable thing, you know, and sometimes you know, it's, it's difficult, but it's so powerful and, and it's so important. Yeah. You know, and Rami, you brought up a great point again about avoidance. Because the shame needs those three in you know, that triangle of, you know, anger, avoidance, and amnesia. 
and major is we forget about why we're upset this way. You know, it's kind of like, I remember in health and science in elementary school, the fire triangle, you need heat, uh, fuel, and oxygen to have the fire triangle. And without one of those three, the fire can't work. Mm-hmm. And the same with us with shame. If we don't have the you know, um, avoidance, anger, and amnesia, shame can't function. You need that triangle. We create that triangle unbeknownst to ourselves to have it work. Yeah. Tell me more about the, the amnesia piece. The amnesia, for instance, is that we don't, you know, many times it could be a, a traumatic background, mm-hmm. uh, things that happen in our families. You know, it could be instability or the chaotic family. And so whenever we feel anger from our partners, we immediately go into shame that we're bad, not remembering why, oh. that, where that came from. It's like, wait a minute, this is today. I'm not eight years old again in this crazy house. I'm now 28, and this is going on, or 38. Amnesia keeps us from looking inside of ourselves and to see the connections under the surface to what's going on. That is so interesting. Isn't it? Denial, yeah. denial amnesia, and avoidance, they are best friends. They they, same coin, same side. You need all three. They work together in sequence. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. like, you're like, I'll ask someone, well, tell us about your childhood. Oh, it's great. I'm always like, okay, well, not that it has to be bad, but, you know, then the amnesia, well, I don't remember what happened. And then the avoidance of it. You know, I have a client, oh, he's in his 70s, came in recently. He doesn't remember anything in his childhood prior to age 18 of really anything positive ever happening. I go, that's impossible because remember, remember being alive, remember playing outside the house. But the avoidance, the amnesia, and the denial keep him safe from whatever uncomfortable feelings he has. And he tends to be very um, obsessive, compulsive, try to control him, try to control him. That's a way to keep the shame and the discomfort at bay. But it's a relentless, as you know, Robin, never... It's very hard on its subjects. It never relents. Yeah. And he's, and you know, older. So question, what happens, like, say, if someone, like, they have those three, right? Yeah. And they're, you know, still going about their life, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, going throughout their day. And, you know, they yeah. haven't um, explored, you know, what it would be like to work through some of this. What happens, like, at least, like, with the person or, like, their life, like, as in, does it end up stunting anything or like hinder any oh, absolutely. affecting? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. You know, many times it'll evolve into addictive behaviors mm. or compulsive behaviors as a way of keeping those three in place. Denial, avoidance, amnesia, that triangle. And many people, they could be addicted to working, shopping, exercising, social media as a way of self-soothing. Whenever those minute, those uncomfortable feelings come up, they anesthetize themselves with behaviors. And that's how, that's the heart of all addictions is not feeling shame. Mm. It's, you know, to self-soothe. And when people start dealing with their behaviors, they realize it was never as concentrated or as complicated. It just was so uncomfortable that they just had to, they just couldn't tolerate it. And that's where that frustration tolerance comes in, comes in, for instance, going with, uh, the fear of embarrassment, that emotional paralysis. So it's like uh, either way, like the self-soothing or some sort of behavior will end up happening, right? Whether or not, like if someone yeah. continues to move forward and they haven't yet explored, you know, work through the, the three things. It's, it's, it's so interesting how either way, like the, the, the mind, the body, like, or just the person is going to try to be grabbing or in some sort of way, um, in some way or another for something to soothe and to, you know, help them. So exactly. Right. Yeah. They will do everything they can to self-soothe mm. that behavior, that uncomfortableness. And I have clients that when someone's upset with them, it is, it could be as minor as a misunderstanding, but it's the end of the world because unless their world feels everything smooth, they don't feel safe. It's mm. very interesting. Yeah. And that has to be really difficult, you know, and yes. In the kind of like the expectation too of is that, you know, like things need to, you know, be, you know, a certain way all the time or need to be, you know, in a level where they're not rejected, say, yes. you know, or feel or feel shameful. That's 
that sounds really, really difficult. Oh, it, it really is. When you really start, you know, kind of peeling away the layers of it, it gets really complicated. Because there's so many addictive behaviors, you know, with shame as a way of covering up. Yeah. Shame and addiction, you know, they're best friends. You know, whether it be through, you know, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, gambling, food, sex, video games, the internet, risky behavior, shopping, type A personalities. Sometimes these are all designed to offset not feeling good enough or feeling vulnerable that way. And it's all on a continuum. Being responsible, going to work every day doesn't mean you're shame-based, but it's the way in which we do it that yeah. becomes problematic. Yeah. And given the, the nature right now with kind of people being at home, but then still wanting to do things or getting kind yes. of restless, maybe even, yeah. you know, I could picture like a lot of, you know, maybe some of the, mm -hmm. um, the addictions that you had mentioned start to really manifest or really just really push through. Yeah. Yeah. This is a big one, Robin. I mean, everything's kind of a shutdown, but like gambling, I mean, there's online gambling, but Las Vegas is closed during yeah. this, uh, crisis that's wild yeah and when you really think about it, it's like that's crazy it's closed which is and a lot of people are like okay i have to sit with myself mm -hmm. you know stay at home literally and figuratively i have to sit with myself very powerful but that that whole that triangle Rob, is really big and chris i'm gonna go another one that a lot of times people don't understand why they get so angry and the people say well they need anger management Anger management is really shame management because anger is feeling powerless, uh, worthless, or invisible, and it comes out as anger as, as a way to have power. That's really interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Anger, for men, I men come all the time, I need anger management. They don't. You need shame management because if you feel good about yourself, you don't have to rage. You don't have to be abusive verbally, physically, sexually. Not at all. But that sense of feeling powerless is what triggers that. Really interesting. I know. It, and with men, I, when I talk about their shame, they look at me like I have three heads. But it, <laughs> you know, like a, it's really true. You know, is that rage is about you not feeling good enough, or the little boy inside of them is doesn't feel healed or cared for. That, that I, I would imagine that being so powerful in the room, though. Oh. You know, to I mean, just kind of putting those pieces together. Oh my! I mean, it doesn't matter how old they are. I want to hear about that seven-year-old that felt mm -hmm. unloved, uncared for. Yeah. Boy, that really gets to it. You know that? And when a man can deal with that, there's a lot of stuff that just goes away in a good way. Better parent can be more present. So much, so many things happen there normally they can't even get to, and they don't feel so reactive or so defensive. And again, being vulnerable, trying to protect that little boy. That's where John Bradshaw, his work, you know, really making shame so public 30 years ago we talked about the wounded inner child and a lot of people say well, that's just touchy feely it's really not it's really i mean it's really relevant and that's part of why i wrote the book the shame factor you yeah. said for men you know I, well, I think anger management is a good start to deal with any type of therapy okay nothing wasted there and you deal with that core self that little boy inside of you that feels neglected wounded unheard or abused. Now you've got a, a man who can really come into his whole masculinity. And for women, the wounded girl, many times, she'll internalize that she's defective. And I say it throughout the book, men externalize their shame, women internalize their shame. And I would wonder, for women, you know, for maybe even certain emotions that's kind of contained yeah. or are kind of held in. Exactly. Too. I mean, so much, you know, the statistics on depression, and anxiety is much more, it's higher for women because they internalize it. Or yeah. men will act it out. We'll act it out. I'll talk about, for instance, you know, the, um, the horrible massacre in Las Vegas a few years back where that man, Stephen, you know, his father, he lost his father when he was seven years old oh. and he never got over it. Oh. Yeah. You know, the, the uh, Las Vegas concert, the yeah. shooter, and he lost his father when he was seven for bank robbery, and the shame, the embarrassment, losing their home, their family, and then you know living in poverty it was terrible. 
Stephen Paddock. And men externalize their shame. Women internalize it. Both equally as harmful in different ways to the individual. You don't hear women going, bringing guns to school. Boys do. Women, will, instead, you know, many times will starve themselves to death. You know, get in the body dysmorphia. Mm-hmm. Things like that are really problematic. It's so interesting, the differences. Isn't it? I always, that's why I look at shame. For guys, ex, um, externalize it. When you look at football, that rage that comes out of football, and then these guys go home and act it out. <laughs> it's like, oh. you know, not, I'm not uh, discrediting sports at all, but I'm not surprised so much of that happens. So interesting. Yeah. And Stephen Paddock is almost a prototype of how men externalize their shame. Wow. And it sounds like, too, the um, experience when he was, he was younger really carried with him. Terrible. You know, and then that's exactly what you've been saying, too, and, and also through the book is how it links back to early childhood experiences. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It really does. And see, and a lot of – I've had people say, oh, my God, I'm glad we're finally talking about shame because – I was diagnosed with a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder. And those are all might be symptoms, but the core is the person felt very defective, which that internal dialogue was very depressive or very anxiety provoking. I just see shame as its own diagnostic element. Yeah, because I would I would picture too in those scenarios, like if they feel like the shame or they feel, you know, defective, that's different than the anxiety and, and the depression, you know, and we also right. kind of look at, you know, the root, yeah. you know, as well. And so I would imagine too, there are, other, there are people out there that maybe have kind of views like, oh, you know, I'm anxious or, you know, I'm depressed. And really it's, they may have felt defective or they, you know, are experiencing yeah. shame. Yeah. So, Ron, before we get out of time here, I want to talk about the five emotional elements of shame. Yeah. Because I talk about shame as emotional cancer. Because mm-hmm. eventually it takes over your life. If you don't pull it out by the roots, it affects your health, your vitality, your career, your relationships, all of us. No one's exempt. And the second piece, there's five five pieces. The second piece is the big secret. It's as if we, like this big secret, if someone finds out, our partner finds out, or our closest friends, it's just, it's terrifying. It's the idea of the secret. And there's a saying in recovery programs, you're only as healthy as your secrets. And shame thrives in the dark. Turn on the light, open the closet door. You know, that monster in the closet turns out to be a yellow rubber raincoat. Like, oh, that's what it was? Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> you know, and it sounds trivial, but when you're in it, it's a big deal. And number four, shame's an inside job. It's not something outside of you. We may blame circumstances and parents and whatnot. And that's Maybe very accurate, but the bottom line is shame's inside of you. And there's outside events that will trigger, but it starts with us inside of us. And the fourth piece about shame is there's this chronic fear or chronic dis-ease of not feeling, quotes, good enough. This chronic nagging. It's like we got this hunter behind us always hunting us. Not good enough. It's when the date, whether it be a man or a woman, it's hard to date somebody. Deep down, you feel like you're not good enough. You know, you overcompensate. And the fifth piece of it is the super glue of shame is addiction mixed with shame. And I mean, I have a school teacher. She, I think she's in debt like 125000 and she makes under 100000 a year. But her addiction when she feels dis-ease or feels criticized by a parent of a student is that she shops. That's what offsets it. You know, immediately after school, she'll go to the mall. She doesn't go online. She goes, in, she goes to department stores because she loves the idea of being, having that power of being able to purchase something when she feels powerless. So those are the five emotional key elements of shame. The first one, I'll just review it, is it's emotional cancer. It just eventually we either, we either take control of it or it controls us. Number two, shame is fueled by the big secret. It holds over us. And number three, it's inside of us. It's not outside. You know, it's not the new job, the new house, new partner. It's inside of us. And number four, people say, how do you know I have shame? Because you have the chronic sense of feeling defective, not good enough, feeling like you haven't done enough. 
And number five, the last piece of it is addiction mixed with shame. That's a hard combination to break. Thank you for that, reviewing yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and I can definitely see um, how, you know, your book would be so helpful and also very empowering. Yeah. You know? Where can the listeners find your book? Oh, you're so sweet, Robin. Thank you. I, I recommend uh, any online store, uh, okay. whether it be Amazon or Barnes & Noble, uh, or you can go to my website. It links it to Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. Uh, and it's the same factor hyphen, heal your deepest fears and set yourself free. And my name's Dr. Stephen Poulter, S-C-E-P-H-A-N. And before we stop, people say, well, how do I start with this? Mm-hmm. And I always tell, just start maybe right now. Be aware of your cycle. You know, like, for instance, not feeling good now. You know, anger. Many times you get angry at somebody, you're raging. Afterwards, you feel the worst. That's shame. You know, and the second piece of it is, you know, with embarrassment, deal, what, what would happen if someone knew what you're embarrassed about? Many times, people don't know what they're embarrassed about. They just know the feeling. And exposing, kind of sitting down, what is this belief really starts to clear out the garden of your life? And this goes for men, women of all ages. Yeah. yeah. There's an old saying, it's not how your kids it's not how you love them. It's how they feel loved. That's mm-hmm. important. And the same thing applies to us as adults. How we talk to ourselves and the tone, internal tone is much more important than what we say to ourselves. You know, for instance, come on, get over it. Versus, come on, get over it. You can do this. Mm-hmm. And there's, a different, there's different ways to say it. One very harsh, one much more supportive and loving. Such a big trigger present day. And as young adults or coming older, having kids or mentoring other people, are like, we want to be a seat. And it can stop with us by exposing it, talking about it. And people say, well, I have a lot of self doubt. And kind of my mind always comes up like, who told you at a young age that you weren't capable? Mm-hmm. That's the first thing that goes in my mind. Who told you you weren't capable? Now, present day, it may be you don't. You have a lot of self-doubt or don't believe in yourself. But someone told you you weren't competent, and that's how it, it plays out in the present day. But, again, Robin, I want to thank you for having me on your show. Fantastic. And talking about shame, and we can get into moms and dads and siblings. So many different ways to go. And yeah. To give you a big overview today. Yeah. Thank you so much for for doing this and for being here. I think um, – you know, I'm hoping everyone's going to go out there and check out your book because it's great. Thank you, know, you. Super, super helpful. So thank you so, so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Robin. And I'll speak with you again. Yes. Take care. Thank you.